medical qualifications beyond 2023. Um, Prof. Indika Karunathilaka, the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, is unable to join uh, due to unavoidable circumstances. So I will be moderating the session. Uh, my name is Asela Olupeliava. I'm the treasurer of the SLMA and I'm a senior lecturer in medical education at the University of Colombo. Today we have an eminent panel of speakers and uh, the session will be shared by Professor Nilanti Di Silva, uh, who is the uh, sharp senior professor and sharp professor of parasitology at uh, the University of uh, Kalania and uh, is also the director of the Quality Assurance Council of the University Grants Commission. Uh, she was also the former Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania, as well as uh, uh, she is currently also the Vice President of the Sri Lanka Medical Council. So uh, with those in introductions, uh, and uh, I would like to hand over to Prof. Nilanti to talk a bit about accreditation and minimum standards in medical education, which are necessary for the recognition of medical qualifications, as well as uh, the interesting number 2023 and why that is very important. Over to you, Madam. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Asela. Uh, thank you for, to the SLMA for having invited me to chair this session. Um, as Asela just said, recognition of medical qualifications beyond 2023 is an interesting topic. The year 2023 uh, was uh, determined really by the ECFMG. Uh, and it is uh, the deadline that was set by the ECFMG for foreign medical schools to uh, obtain accreditation um, from uh, a accrediting body which is accredited by the either the WFME or uh, equivalent agency. And it is that uh, process and that procedure that we will be talking about this uh, during the uh, course of this uh, pre-conference workshop uh, and I'm sure the speakers that we have a very eminent lineup of speakers uh, who will elaborate further on this idea and the importance of uh, accrediting medical schools in today's context because this is something that is uh, of global importance given that there has been a mushrooming of medical schools um, in the world but particularly in South Asia. Uh, so I'm not going to take a lot of your time uh, but let's get on to our eminent panel of speakers and I will hand back to our sailor to introduce our speakers. Our sailor. Uh, thank you, Madam. And uh, so we have uh, speakers, both uh, local and international, and uh, relate in uh, various uh, uh, organizations. Uh, and uh, first of all, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Thomas Sapata, uh, who is from the World Health Organization Southeast Asian uh, Regional uh, Office. And uh, Dr. Tapata has uh, had, uh, uh, you know, is uh, has contributed much to uh, accreditation of uh, uh, accreditation activities in uh, medical as well as other health professions, uh, education institutions in the South Asian region. And uh, he also contributed in person uh, when a couple of years back we had a workshop. Uh, at the SLMA on accreditation. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Sapata uh, to open uh, the uh, speech uh, talk as well as give a brief introduction on accreditation uh, and uh, accreditation activities in the region. 
Thank you, Dr. Sapata. Over to you. I cannot. Uh, okay, very good. I, I can see that you can hear me. Very good. So then I will start. If you don't mind, I will share my screen because uh, I have a PowerPoint. Uh, if you allow me to share the screen, I will appreciate that. Okay. Uh, hold on a second. Okay, thank you. Let me go for it. Very good. Okay, very good. So let's start. This slide here, one second. Well, thank you very much for the organizers for giving us the opportunity, giving me the opportunity to, to do this presentation. And I think um, it's really timely for Sri Lanka in terms of uh, uh, moving forward in the accreditation system. First thing I want to raise is the changing needs in, uh, in our region. I, I just want to give a regional perspective. And um, we have the demographic and epidemiological transition in our region, in the Southeast Asia region. So population is uh, aging, and at the same time, the NCDs are on the rise. And also with a, a pattern of urbanization, I think this, uh, these are the three major changing needs in, in our region. So I think we need to adapt to this change in education system and the medical education system also has to adapt to these changing needs. So in the region, we also have issues on quality of healthcare. That's not new, but it's something that is there. As, as, as mentioned by the chair, there is a mass roaming of private medical schools in many uh, countries in the region and quality of uh, medical education is an issue in, in, in many of them. So this is really something that is also a concern in the, in the region. Then also there has been a changes in the approaches to medical education. And as I said, changing needs. So I think we need to adapt the way, uh, the way medical uh, students are taught and what they are taught. I think this is the, the, the meaning of transformative education is how we change the way we teach and what we teach in order to be aligned with changing needs. So I think that's, that's the concept of transformative education. And then, uh, uh, as I said before, there is a rise in, 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 in medical schools, and probably we need to take that into consideration. And I think we need to address the three gaps that we have. We have a first gap, which is the qualification or training knowledge gap. So the first gap is that in many medical schools in our region, people are trained, but they don't get the knowledge that they are supposed to get because of the quality of the education system. So that's the first gap that we have. The second one is whether these medical students are taught and uh, acquire the competencies that they are supposed to uh, get in order to be able to respond when they provide services, when they provide clinical services to respond to the, to the, to the needs that are changing. So second gap is between the competencies and the needs gap. And the third one is the knowledge do gap. Even if we manage to have quality medical educations that they know what they have to do. I mean, they have the knowledge, but many times there is an issue of effort. There is an issue of motivation that medical, uh, medical physicians or, or doctors, they do not apply what they know into practice. And here is what I, as I said, issues of uh, effort and motivation. So we have some systems failures and mismatch of competency to needs, uh, weak team work, gender stratification, hospital dominance over primary care, labor market imbalances, weak leadership for health system performance, and professional silos. All this comes a little bit of the 2010 paper of Julio Frank, which was kind of a milestone for transformative education. But what is accreditation? We know that Accreditation, um, it will be widely discussed, so I don't want to pay much attention, but at the end of the day, accreditation is, a, is about a way of improving quality of education. I think that should be the final end, not just going through a checklist and ticking boxes, but it should be a way of ensuring improving education, quality of education, and not for the sake of improving quality of education, but for the sake of improving quality of services later on with all those physicians are providing health services. So that's the critical 
a, a purpose of, of, of accreditation. And I think we, we can talk about accreditation of programs and also of accreditation of institutions while we talk about licensing for individuals. But still, I think um, we also went through a regional expert workshop in 2018 in February in Bangkok and Sri Lanka was there. And what we notice is the different language between countries. Some countries like Indonesia or Thailand, they refer to accreditation a lot and they have put systems in place, while other countries like India or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka, you tend to talk more about recognition. So I think also the definition is not that simple. And at the end of the day, it means many different things for different people. And we also don't have a one magic bullet on the way accreditation should be. If you look at the international experience, you see a very wide, uh, uh, a lot of ex different experiences and different dimensions of accreditation, as I will show later. You know that in the WHO, we have the 2013 guidelines on transformative education, which di with different interventions to improve education, and one of them is accreditation. Then uh, in the recommendations, this recommendation on accreditation came out at a strong, despite the low evidence uh, that we have. So also there was a recommendation to increase uh, research in, in, in accreditation and making the link between improving accreditation, improving quality of education and improving quality of health services. I think that, that we need more research in, in, that, in those three steps. So anyway, so then we also have in the global strategy 2016 that WHO developed, one of the milestones is that by 2020, all countries will have established accreditation systems. So it's a milestone in the global strategy on human resources for health. That's why in the region, we have put a lot of effort on this and also in the Colombo AAAH meeting, uh, Asia Pacific Action Alliance on Human Resources for Health, uh, held in 2016 in Colombo, six countries agreed that accreditation was a main priority for them to improve quality of education. And then we, there's been a lot of um, initiatives going on in different directions. And the latest one I just want to refer in this slide to the latest one was the Global Symposium on Health Workforce Accreditation and Regulation that was held in Istanbul in December 2019, last year. So it was attended by 54 countries, and, uh, and this was a milestone because I think now all uh, regions, WHO regions in the world, and are, are moving in this direction of improving accreditation systems. Also, Thailand, as you know, is organizing every year a transformative education forum in the region, and this year was a specific on accreditation. And actually, there, were a particip there was participation of seven CR countries in this transformative education uh, meeting. In our region, Bang Thailand and Indonesia are the countries more advanced on accreditation. They went through a deep reform of the accreditation system, setting up autonomous uh, bodies, quite independent from the government, in order to improve the accreditation system, not only for medical stu uh, studies, but also for nursing, physiotherapy, and other health professions. So what they have at the moment is an autonomous body uh, con uh, regulating and accrediting uh, all the medical schools. And uh, the main purpose is improving uh, um, quality of education. And the important thing is that in 2019, they have been recognized, the accreditation agency has been recognized by the World Federation of Medical Education, which is linked to the 2023 deadline, which has been extended to 2024, just one month ago, because of COVID-19. So the deadline is not anymore 2023, it's going to be 2024, which basically every medical student willing to work in the US will have who have been trained in a medical school that has been accredited by a national accreditation agency that has been recognized by the World Federation of Medical Education. And the deadline, uh, again, 2024, okay? And as I said before, different terminologies in different countries, I also mentioned that on India, Bangladesh, 
and Sri Lanka. And this is the picture, this table is the picture that we have at the moment. So most of our countries in the region do have accreditation, accreditation agencies, but the level of quality and the level of um, functionality of these agencies varies a lot from one country to another. Anyway, I, I, I don't want to go through all this, but you can have different standards for uh, setting up accreditation systems, the WFME, you also have the UK uh, system, but anyway, the important thing I think is uh, set the, setting up autonomous bodies that uh, they are quite objective, that they don't have conflict of interest, and that, that can really improve the quality of services. And I think if, if Sri Lanka is trying to go in this direction, it will be important to engage with the councils, the autonomous bodies, the Ministry of Education, professional associations, and then also link up with other regional network. I think that will be important to, to have the buy-in since the beginning, and there will be a lot of resistance, but I think it's important to bring everyone on the table since they want to move this agenda forward. And then uh, regarding the, the global symposium, as I said, it was in November, in December in Istanbul, 250 participants from 54 countries and six year countries were represented. Uh, Professor Indica was uh, part of the delegation, the CR delegation, and he was very much actively engaged in the discussions. Just some key points coming out from this uh, global conference. Uh, one of them, the main message is that there is not one magic bullet. There is not one system that fits all. There are multiple systems all over the world. And all these dimensions that you see here, these six points, I think there are different countries are doing different things. So I think what is important for Sri Lanka is understanding well the context and then looking at experiences from different countries and taking your own decisions or who is going to do what, which organization, which institution is going to set up or run the accreditation system, what functions are going to be performed by that accreditation agency, who is going to be funding, how are you going to get the funding for this uh, accreditation agency and the running operating activities. Fourth, what type of professions are you going to start by medical education and then expanding for other professionals? That's something you have to decide as well. Geographical distribution is going to be centralized in the country, it's going to be decentralized, and then each region will have accreditation power. That's something that there are different experiences all over the world. And then compulsory versus voluntary. We have countries like the Philippines where accreditation is voluntary, while we have countries like Thailand where accreditation is compulsory. So there are many different examples, and you have to take your own decisions and agree on the way forward in all these different dimension. So I think that's something important for you to, to discuss internally. And then, as I said before, more research will be needed and probably this is also a good opportunity since you will start with uh, improving the accreditation system, is thinking of research questions on how you can monitor progress and how you can monitor the improvement of quality of education, if possible, attributed to uh, improving accreditation systems. And then in, in terms of uh, some challenges, I already mentioned the quality issue several times because I think it's a, a critical idea. The uh, second one is the autonomy of the institutions. Uh, sometimes, you know, there are a lot of conflicts of interest or they are too much dependent on government. Or, so you need to find the right balance there. There is no right wrong, but you, I think you have to take your own decisions there to ensure the integrity and the professionalism, also obtaining the adequate financial resources, otherwise it will not be sustainable. And then uh, it's not only about um, ensuring minimum standards, but also stimulating further uh, development. And then at the end of the day, it's about creating a, 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 quality, uh, a quality culture. I think that's the main issue on how different medical schools keep on reflecting and keep on using the recommendation from the accreditation agency to progressively improve quality of education, which I know is pretty high in Sri Lanka, but there is always scope to increase and to improve. And then the final slide as conclusions, I would say that uh, the creating the culture of quality again, 
Uh, accreditation means many different things. So when you look at different countries, you need to look at these different dimensions and understand who is doing what at these different dimensions. Countries are at different stages. Some of them are pretty much advanced, while other, they are just starting. In CRO, we have made some progress, but we still have a long way to go. Accreditation of other professional categories uh, beyond medical education is, is important as well because we also need to improve the quality of those health professions. And then we also find that uh, accreditation systems are very much linked to overall health systems governance. When you have a good overall governance uh, systems, you will have good accreditation systems. It's pretty much linked. And then it's important since the beginning, considering the implications of introducing accreditation systems in terms of balance of power in terms of resistance, in terms of budgetary issues, I think you need to consider all these uh, dimensions uh, before starting accreditation, because accreditation is not the only solution to improve quality of education. So you need to take into account all these things. And uh, learning from experiences from other countries. And then at the end of the day, the research question, does really accreditation improve, uh, contribute to improve quality of education and quality of service? I think that's the the, 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 the final uh, question. I think I will stop here. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sapata. And uh, I think those uh, the introduction on accreditation, what it means, uh, its place uh, in relation to quality assurance, as well as uh, the uh, regional perspective uh, about medical education, as well as uh, other health professions education, was very valuable. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Palita Bacon, who is. Uh, uh, I, I'm sure does not need much introduction to the Sri Lankan audience. So he has, uh, he can give a, uh, provide both a global perspective as well as a local perspective, uh, as he has uh, uh, headed uh, many, uh, you know, uh, many units in the World Health Organization uh, in the Southeast Asian uh, Regional Office, as well as uh, with his expertise in medical education and public health. Uh, currently, he's uh, working as a consultant to the WHO. So uh, over to you, Dr. Abe Kohn, uh, to provide your perspectives on uh, recognition of medical qualifications and accreditation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asela. Good afternoon. First of all, I was very happy that uh, Thomas uh, spoke uh, just before I was due to speak because uh, Thomas led the, the, the foundation and gave the, the total perspective of the subject we are dealing with. I, I'm sorry, I do not have any slides, but I'll make a few comments uh, and then uh, respond uh, if uh, there are any questions at the end. I will speak on two subheadings, uh, as you might say. One is the context, and uh, this I'm going to, to localize what, uh, what uh, Thomas said uh, in this uh, beginning. See, there are two, two issues that we need to remember always, and that uh, the heart of medical education is the underlying assumption and the commitment of the medical schools and the teachers uh, that the, the health of the population and the needs of the population is the cardinal purpose of medical education. And this assumption is there. And the second is that the commitment that the health professionals are accountable to the communities in which they serve. The third is that the students are entitled to a quality education. And fourthly, of course, this has become very current in Sri Lanka, very relevant to Sri Lanka. Many students return after medical education from a number of countries outside. And uh, we got to make sure that quality is assured and they are competent to work in our system. Now, having said that, if you take the Sri Lankan situation and we are talking of medical education beyond 
2024 now, it was 2023, as uh, Thomas said, now it's going to be 2024. There are two things that we might do think uh, in, in relation to medical education. One is again, the larger context where for Sri Lanka, we are committed to the SDGs, we are committed to the universal health coverage goals, we are committed to primary health care, and particularly as the sustainable development goal number three, which refers to health and well-being. And most of that would be very relevant to us in medical education and also in other health professionals education. Then we have to learn from the experience that you are just going through the COVID-19. There will be some implications both for the content of education, objectives of education, as well as the strategies of education. As we can see, things are changing as we talk. For example, how do we train students to deal with advancing technology? I see two issues here. One is the choices that countries got to make with regard to technology, which is growing every day. And secondly, there's a policy issue, a governance issue. How do we make it affordable and available to the larger population in our countries? Economic aspects, uh, assessment aspects will play a key factor here. In education, in the larger context, we also have uh, to relate to the democratization of educational opportunities. And this will have a direct bearing on what we are talking of, quality assurance. We see the need for this inside Sri Lanka sometimes, as well as in relation to the large numbers who are returning to Sri Lanka from edu medical education abroad. Then there are serious implications to the quality assurance managers. And here I refer to the ones like the medical schools themselves, the, the Ministry of Health, and particularly to the Sri Lanka Medical Council. I will not mention the, the general problems that we have with regard to numbers, specialties, distributions, the skill mixes. They will all matter a lot. Certainly they will matter a lot. They, are, they matter a lot now and they'll continue to matter after 2024. Then with regard to the other strategies, Thomas mentioned this, uh, this concept of transformative education, which I think is slowly gaining ground, gaining currency, still not fully internalized in some of our countries, but I'm sure the instructional and institutional changes that need to be taking place, it will slowly get absorbed into our system. And another key emerging issue that we got to remember, I feel, is multi-professional practice and multi-professional education. And how do we handle this? And lastly, and not, not the least anyway, the increasing community expectations and the increasing health literacy of our populations, which will require different modes of education, issues of communication, empathy, humanities, the whole works that need to be. And WFME accreditation, if you look at it, has included these aspects also in some of the areas that they insist on being assessed. Yeah, then of course, the issue of rural retention, which is also, I think, a point of great interest to all of us and also WHO. Thomas, for example, is very interested in this and he's been doing a lot of work in this area, which will be ultimately a key to achieving UHC through the PHC approaches that we are talking of. Then, of course, our COVID taught us that distance education or different types of educational technologies can be used uh, more than what we have been doing so far. And I believe 2024 onwards, we'll have more of this happening and more of this will be used and we will have to get familiar with that. With that background, I want to now come to some of the direct issues of accreditation. And Thomas mentioned the, the fact that accreditation is the word used now more and more commonly by most countries. But we have been, particularly those of us who grew up in the British Commonwealth, we have been using the word recognition. And still, if you see the General Medical Council does not use the word accreditation, they use quality assurance and other words, but not yet the word accreditation. But more or less, the, the, the principle behind is that, like Thomas said, quality assurance, quality assurance in different different dimensions that we want to, to train our students to, to be ultimately capable of. The WFME process, I mean, for those of you who who uh, probably have not been in this for a while. I have been uh, in this uh, for about 30 years now. Uh, yeah, quite long. Uh, WFME actually was not a very powerful organization, say, 30 years ago. It was uh, 
the, the impetus for what is happening now came in the late 90s when Henry Walton organized his famous Edinburgh conferences. But then accreditation was not an issue because it was not a word being used because Henry Walton being from UK, he used the word, word quality assurance and recognition. Then the, 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 the leadership of the WFME moved to Europe and Hans Karl, Professor Hans Karl from Copenhagen became the president and we worked with him because we were in the Southeast the CRM where Indica and them are now active. We formed the CRM like, and in fact, we were the second organization to, to be formed as a regional grouping in medical education. And we all worked together with the WF, WFME. The same time as Thomas will know, WHO itself, which was maintaining the register of medical schools, was slowly handing it over to the World Federation to maintain this list and different things. That, that's another aspect. And the World Federation then got linked up with the FEMA group and they developed a number of very important and very big programs with regard to quality control of medical education. And this idea of accreditation emerged during some of those discussions in the, at the turn of this century. And now, of course, as you can see, it has come almost come full circle. And accreditation is now a fact of life and is going to be with us from now on, I don't know for how long. Now, WFME, as you know, developed all those uh, the, the documents with regard to undergraduate, postgraduate, continuing professional development. They are, they are very rich, very richly research, researched and very, very uh, informative and useful documents. With regard to accreditation, but WF, the FEMA group and ECFMG have no role in accreditation on doing the, doing the assessment. It's the WFME that goes and does the recognition process. The program is handled by the WFME, but they might get some experts from the occasionally. What they do is they go and evaluate, I'm mentioning the key things which might be useful for us to, to remember. They look at the legal standing of the body the, in the country. They look at the accreditation or regulation process. They look at post accreditation monitoring. And they look at the way the decisions are made in this body in relation to accrediting regulation. And they determine what the particular country and that body in the country uh, is, uh, is, is made of and how it is doing. Thomas mentioned some of the dimensions that they look at. Now, what they do is they send a team of four or five people, two independent experts and group from the WF, within the WFME itself to a country and they look at the, the different things as dimensions of this particular body in dealing with accreditation. And they also visit with, when, the, when that particular body goes to, to recognize or create a medical school or a nursing school, they visit with them and observe the process. They don't directly participate at the school level. They only monitor the work that is done by the body. So in Sri Lanka, for example, right now, if we decide to get the WFME involved, WFME will probably, not probably, I think they will work with the Sri Lanka Medical Council and they look at all these dimensions of the medical council. I'll mention a little bit about this uh, now and then I'll finish my little um, presentation. Now, as uh, Thomas said, two, uh, two countries in, in our region, in our Southeast Asia region, have already got accredited, Thailand and Indonesia. And I think this was 2028, they give a 10 year recognition, 2028 and 2029. But now I find that a number of other countries are also planning to do that. Bangladesh has formed a different uh, accreditation body and they are trying to go that way. Uh, India at, is, is a slow moving thing because India's uh, recognition process is very different to the other countries. Therefore, it probably will take a long time. I suppose Myanmar will also, one of these days will be on the way. Uh, then you find, if you look at the WFME recent uh, uh, news that they, in their website, more and more countries are somehow getting this accredited, their uh, national bodies accredited by the World Federation. The last I remember was Ireland. Of course, England has not, but England has got you know, established so much. I don't think uh, American guys are going to ask uh, uh, England, the GMC, whether you are accredited by the WFME, not, not for a while. So they may not have that problem. But at the moment, if we use this 2023 or 2024 deadline, it will, so at the moment, it will not affect Sri Lankans very much. 
I mean, that is my perception. So I could be totally wrong in this, and I, I, I apologize. Because not many Sri Lankans go to the States, unlike in those days. But there are still who might like to go. There are many who might want to go. So they probably will be, to a large extent, uh, limited if Sri Lanka does not somehow go this route and get ourselves, our, our council or whatever body we form around it, a crater. But the question will come to Sri Lanka if, by some chance, now Australia Medical Council has got a crater. So if some of the other countries which receive our, our the recipient countries who receive our graduates, if they also start putting this clause in, I don't know whether they will, I have no idea, but if they do, more and more difficulties will come to the Sri Lankan graduates who come out of our medical schools from now to the next sort of 10, 15 years at least. So then I think if that happens, if another country fails, say, of, for instance, for instance, I hope I hope it doesn't happen, but in, in case Australia also says we need this, then I think there will be a little bit of uh, concern in our country also, particularly among the younger students and the younger graduates. So we may have to be a little bit on the alert. Now, the next question I would ask is if Sri Lanka, after a national level discussion, after, after a discussion with the, the, the stakeholders here, the medical schools, the government, uh, the other professional bodies, if they, can, uh, if they do come to some consensus that it is worthwhile for Sri Lanka, it is worthwhile for Sri Lanka to get accredited by this World Federation uh, system, uh, I, I feel it will not be difficult for Sri Lanka. We have to make a few adjustments. We will make, make some, a couple of major ones, but others will be very minor because we have a tradition of doing our medical school recognition and we have laid down procedures for this. But you need to be, we will need to tighten some of those and fall in line with some of the universal kind of guidelines and uh, which have been laid down by the WFME. So I will not talk about that. Maybe that should be a point that we discuss which way we go. If the Sri Lanka Medical Council is the focal point, which I think it should be the focal point, clearly. They may have to work with two, three other uh, similar bodies and uh, come into some kind of adjustment uh, to make a very justifiable, very strong, technically and otherwise, body that could get accredited uh, by, the, by the World Federation. We have a number of things going in Sri Lanka. So we have uh, two things which are very, very useful and I think that's why I feel there should be, a, should be no problem. We have the university system, which has a quality control mechanism by itself. And there are many people who are, who are experts in that. Then we have the SLMC, which has its own uh, uh, system and which I've been doing it for long, not only locally, but even for outside. But it needs some, some twitching, obviously we know that. And we also have now, uh, which many countries do not have, a rich group of medical educationists who have who have learned you know, up to very high level and who have developed a lot of expertise within and outside the country who can be used for this purpose. So I think for Sri Lanka, it will be a piece of cake if we, if we really take it to heart. I'm going to finish now and uh, then uh, just, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, I will not want to repeat some of the things that uh, Thomas has said. So I leave with this uh, thoughts that, okay, accreditation by the word you use uh, has its own sort of uh, uh, what parameters, which are very similar, quite similar to what we are already doing under the, the rubric of recognition. There are some things which are different and those are significant when it comes to getting the approvals or the recognition of the World Federation. But for Sri Lanka, if we choose to do that, if we don't choose to do that, locally, there will be, for practice in Sri Lanka, obviously there's no issue, but for practice in other countries in time to come, we may face some issues. And I think it may not be fair for the younger students and doctors who are coming out to not to at least have thought of it seriously and uh, leave it without uh, serious consideration. But if we do, decide ultimately with the wise counsel, with, with uh, good discussion uh, among the interested parties. If we do decide that we should try and get recognition for our body, I think it's a distinct possibility and it should not 
take too long. And we can certainly, if we want, we can keep the 2023 and definitely the 2024 de deadline. And that is my belief and that is my reading of the situation. Uh, so I will stop there and uh, I can respond to any questions that you might want to ask. Thank you very much, uh, Asela. Thank you very much. Asela? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sorry, Baker. Sorry, I, maybe I, you, yes, I went out, uh, out there. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm also around, sir. So thank you for that <laughs> Sorry, very Rati. Stimu Sorry, stimulating you. Uh, uh, you know, presentation. And uh, even in the absence of slides, I think you raised some really important aspects and issues that we need to think about in Sri Lanka. If we are going to move towards accreditation yeah. of medical schools and what we need to um, address and the challenges that we have to meet, as well as the strengths that we have in our country, which will enable us to meet those challenges. So thank you. Uh, we will take all of the questions, I think, at, I have a few myself, uh, but we will take all of those questions at the end after we have heard from all of the speakers. So Asela is now going to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Professor Dujipa Samarasekara. Asela? Thank you, Dr. Palita. And uh, our next speaker is, uh, again, uh, no stranger to both uh, Sri Lankan as well as international audiences. Uh, Dr. Jujip Samarsekara is the director of the Center for Medical Education at the uh, National University of uh, Singapore. And uh, he's an uh, uh, eminent medical educationist, uh, product of Sri Lanka. And, uh, and he has done much work uh, with regards to um, quality assurance and accreditation. And indeed, he's an executive committee member of the World Federation for Medical Education, WFME. So uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Jujipa to share his thoughts. And I believe he has a presentation as well. So uh, over to you, Dr. Jujipa. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Asela. Uh, again, it's my pleasure to be uh, here with you. And also, I want to thank uh, SLMA and all uh, the organizers uh, for inviting me. Yeah, yes, I do have a, a short PowerPoint presentation, but much of my uh, sharing, uh, I think the previous two speakers, Dr. Zapata and uh, Professor Dr. Palita Bikun, has uh, shared uh, and, and covered. Uh, I think I'm wearing my hat uh, here today as an executive council member of the World Federation of Medical Education and also as the president of the Western Pacific uh, Association for Medical Education, which is the branch organization of the, the WFME in this part of the world. Um, the focus of my presentation would be uh, on accreditation of medical schools and programs. Much of it has been covered and the role of the WFME uh, and the recognition process itself. Again, I think uh, Dr. Palita Abikon has covered most of it. And also I want to share some of the future medical education landscape uh, some of the things that are happening, and I think it's good that if we know what is happening in the region or closer to our regions, then we know uh, how to align ourselves and to develop our own systems and processes as well. So I think I, I will focus a little bit on this at the very end. Um, to start off with, I think uh, we, we discussed the, the accreditation. Oh, by the way, most of my presentation is based on the the WFME uh, website, you can find all this information or a lot more if you go to the WFME uh, uh, website and, and uh, all the information is there. Um, so basically, uh, I'm not going to go through the accreditation. I think uh, Dr. Abikon nicely covered this area very well. But I think the, uh, the aim of accreditation, why we are now moving into accreditation in a big way across the globe, is to basically to ensure patient safety uh, through developing competent practicing doctors and also uh, to ensure that uh, there, there's uh, some level of quality uh, that, is, uh, that is delivered by the medical schools themselves. Um, sorry. So I think uh, Dr. Zapata mentioned about this objective of uh, WHO in 2016, uh, the objective 1.1. By 2020, all countries uh, will have an established accreditation mechanisms for health training institutions. 
So I think these are some of the background to why the accreditation is becoming quite uh, important, not only for medical, but other health professionals as well. So uh, very, very briefly, uh, I think the WHO policy on the promotion of accreditation of basic medical education was developed and agreed in a strategic partnership with the World Federation of Medical Education. And the guidelines for accreditation of uh, medical education was developed and published jointly by WHO and WFM in 2005. And this was revised uh, later on. And uh, the, the second revision is there now. And we are right now undergoing the third revision to the basic standards. The third revisions are going to be completely different. And uh, it is being led by uh, Professor uh, Michael Fields, uh, John Norsini, and also Janet Grant. Uh, uh, Professor um, Michael Fields was my previous uh, uh, president of uh, the Western Pacific Association. So they are leading this and we are right now, uh, the Executive Council as well as the, some of our other stakeholders are reviewing what is proposed and this hopefully will be in place in another year, uh, not one year's time. Um, and the focus of the newer basic standards is actually to, to really look at outcomes rather than the processes. Right, so I think uh, the, the guidelines uh, from all this in 2013 uh, was formed and was also accepted by IMRA, the International Association of Medical Regulatory Authorities as well. So this is a very quick brief uh, background uh, to it. Uh, the accreditation process. And I think this uh, was discussed by uh, Professor Palita Abekon. Uh, he shared about the, the world directory, the history of the world directory. However, there's also another directory called the DORA, uh, or DORA stands for the Directory of Organizations that Recognize Accredited Medical Schools, which uh, WFME also um, uh, uh, conform to and also maintains. So the World Directory is a free searchable directory uh, that is available on undergraduate basic medical education. And up to now, I think there are about more than 2,900 schools uh, listed there. Uh, the World Directory, as uh, Dr. Palita mentioned earlier, moved from starting with the WHO, then it combined with the International Medical Education Directory, and later uh, uh, also the, the Avicenna directories, and now it is uh, helmed by the WFME and uh, FEMA together. But one thing I want to state is that listing in the World Directory confirms that the medical, edu medical school exists, but it does not denote recognition, accreditation, or endorsement by the World Directory or WFME or FEMA. So this is something that we need to understand. Just because there's a medical school listed in the World Directory does not mean that, uh, it does not mean anything about the quality of the medical school. So if you look at the, the directory, uh, the most number of medical schools uh, in a single country, uh, India is leading. I think uh, India is in the, the, the Southeast uh, or regional organization. Uh, followed by Brazil, uh, USA, Canada, Pakistan, Mexico, Japan, Russian Federation, Indonesia, and Turkey. So these are the top countries with the largest number of medical schools uh, in their own countries. Now, I want to focus a little bit on the WFME recognition program, which uh, Dr. Abekon mentioned a little while ago. So this started off uh, as part of, as uh, he mentioned, uh, a joint uh, uh, collaboration with uh, the with ECFMG. So it's an independent, transparent, and a rigorous method of ensuring the accreditation of medical schools worldwide. Uh, it's an internationally acceptable, globally benchmarked with good standard. Right? So it was established mainly to ensure the accreditation system operates in a robust, transparent, non-referenced way, and also to prevent the rapid expansion of the number of medical schools worldwide. So these are some of the background to the WFME recognition program. However, I must state that this is a misconcept that a lot of people believe that WFME does not accredit individual medical school. Uh, what the WFME does is that we evaluate the legal standing, accreditation process, uh, post-accreditation monitoring, the decision-making process of an accrediting agency for programs or schools in a particular country. Um, so the WFME recognition status is given to an uh, agency, 
uh, the understanding that the quality of medical education in its accredited schools is at an appropriate and also maintains a very rigorous standard. Now, what is the benefit of this WFME recognition status? First of all, it is a global mark of recognition. Once you get the recognition status from WFME, it recognizes that the, the, the authority which recognizes the medical school actually engages in a very robust and uh, uh, internationally benchmark rigorous process in accrediting all their medical schools. It also uh, improves the standards of training of all the medical schools that particular institution accredits. So through this process of uh, international recognition, we hope that in the future, across the globe, the standard of medical education will rise. And I think the real impetus came with the ECFMG. I think Dr. Sapata mentioned it is now 2024. Uh, we, we actually work very closely with uh, uh, ECFMG, the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates, ECFMG, with uh, uh, Dr. William Pinsky and, uh, and his group. Um, what I wanted to also share, what I think Prof. Uh, the, Dr. Panita Bekun uh, did not mention, is that this is not only the ECFMG requirement, is not only to go and work in US, but also for any medical student, resident, or postgraduate trainee who wants to go there for a training program will not be eligible unless the, there is uh, unless the authority in which the medical school gets its accreditation is recognized or have an equivalent standard uh, that is recognized by ECFMG. So I think uh, with this, there was a lot of now focus and uh, 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 support uh, that the WFME got from many different countries and other state uh, uh, institutes. So um, the last part, I think this is my last two slides. Uh, the, why is this happening also? So I think uh, Dr. Sapata mentioned a little bit about this migration and, uh, and mobility. Well, it started off with the European Union, the Bologna process, where they uh, uh, passed a law. If you, if you graduate from one medical school, the, that particular graduate should be able to move without any further uh, exams or tests or barriers to any other EU nation and practice. So we saw that a lot of doctors from different countries, especially from uh, the Eastern European countries, moving into countries like Italy, Germany, France, and United Kingdom until the, the time that they moved out. Well, in 2015, in the Southeast Asian countries, the ASEAN countries, the ASEAN leaders also signed a very similar decla declaration. So, which means this is the, the skilled migration or the skilled labor mobility agreement. So, within ASEAN countries, all the, the, the graduates should be able to move across ASEAN countries. So, this actually refers to not only to doctors, but nurses and other health professionals, but also to uh, engineers and other professions as well. So this was signed and by 2020, by this year, we should have um, you know, uh, ratified this. The, the agreement was also ratified, but all the countries would have removed all the barriers for doctors and other health professionals to move around. But you know that it is uh, with a lot of challenges. So there are quite a lot of work done in this area. And we are finding in the ASEAN region, there's quite a bit of uh, problems and issues making this happening, but we have to. This has been signed and we have to sign. Uh, we have to agree to this uh, new agreement. So what has happened, as uh, Dr. Sapata mentioned earlier, Thailand has set up uh, IMEC, and this is actually in line. We all collaborated together, uh, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, sorry, Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and all these countries actually, uh, we, we actually work together and uh, they set up the Institute for Medical Education Accreditation, an independent and autonomous body to accredit all medical schools, not only in Thailand, but in the ASEAN countries as well. So this single institution now could accredit um, other medical schools within the ASEAN region. 
So this is one way that uh, some of the countries and some of the uh, uh, regions have come together rather than trying to get individual accreditation they have grouped together i'm going to show you uh, my next slide few few of these examples uh, they have got together and they have actually set up an independent autonomous body to accredit multiple uh, uh, medical schools in other countries so i, I think uh, this is uh, this is an important uh, development now we are seeing uh, in accreditation and recognition of medical schools right so uh, what are the agencies with recognition status up to now from WFME? So we have from, uh, so Caribbean is another example where all the small, small Caribbean countries have come together and, and uh, set up this independent authority. And another authority is the Association for Evaluation and Accreditation of Medical Education Programs. Uh, so this also actually has come together uh, for Palestine, Oman, Qatar, Kuwait, Lebanon. Uh, so these are another organization that has come together. And some of the countries like Canada, United States, uh, and uh, uh, even Australia, what they have done is that they are using their own medical councils and they, the medical councils themselves, the statutory bodies, have got the recognition. So we have now Canada, United States of America, Republic of Korea is again an independent autonomous body. Uh, we have also from the Middle East and also North America, uh, Japan, again, another independent autonomous body, Australian Medical Council, that's the statutory body, uh, which accredits both Australia and New Zealand medical school. Uh, then also the, the former Soviet republics have come together uh, and they have set up uh, another accrediting agency. Um, and you can see that uh, Georgia, the Thailand is the one that I mentioned earlier. Indonesia itself has developed their own accreditation body. So these are the countries currently have got the accreditation or what you call the recognition status from WFME. And you can see the, the number of years that they are uh, supposed to, uh, their accreditation status is, uh, will be continued. So the last, as uh, Dr. Abikon mentioned, it's Ireland. And there are a few who have applied and currently waiting for the visits because of the current situation around the globe. This has got delayed. Uh, so these are like Jordan, uh, Karakistan, Bahrain, Colombia, Israel, uh, Kazakhstan itself, uh, Granada, uh, and uh, some the Latin American countries, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Philippines. So they have their own uh, councils have applied for the recognition status from the, the World Federation of Medical, uh, Medical Education. So I think uh, that's my uh, kind of you know, brief overview of what is happening around the globe and why that uh, the accreditation is becoming quite uh, important and useful. And I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of uh, these presentations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jijipa. Uh, uh, so uh, I think, uh, uh, there were some very useful uh, uh, information, particularly about the accreditation uh, which are happening in other countries, as well as the scope of this uh, whole endeavor. And there are some uh, interesting questions also, uh, which we can direct to the speakers, probably right at the end of the uh, all the presentations. So uh, um, there was a lot of uh, uh, Many of the speakers mentioned about uh, how the National Medical Council can be involved in accreditation endeavors of the different countries and uh, their role. And uh, so uh, our next speaker uh, is going to be from the Sri Lanka Medical Council, uh, the Dr. Ananda Hapagoda, Registrar of the Sri Lanka Medical Council, uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Hapugoda to speak next on uh, his views and the uh, views of the SLMC on accreditation and accreditation, its importance and its processes in Sri Lanka. Over to you, Dr. Hapugoda. Yeah, hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And we have heard a lot of meaningful uh, discussion on uh, accreditation, the academic aspect. Uh, the, my role as the, uh, the Registrar of Sri Lanka Medical Council is to tell you why this is not happening in Sri Lanka to a satisfactory level. 
before that, I would like to uh, mention little about Sri Lanka Medical Council. Sri Lanka Medical Council established in 1924 uh, is the oldest medical council in the region. And we are older to the India and many other medical councils. And um, basically we have, we are the statutory regulator of the medical profession and we have four main duties, statutory duties. Uh, one is the registration of practitioners, then the maintenance of minimum standard of medical education and the maintenance of minimum standard of postgraduate medical education and maintenance of discipline of the practitioners. And we have powers, vested powers. We have powers to make regulations and we have powers to punish practitioners found guilty of disciplinary inquiries. So uh, the Medical Council uh, got really interested in accreditation program as uh, Dr. Palita Bepon clearly mentioned. Our ordinance, we don't have a single word about accreditation, but it, uh, we are, what we are doing is uh, recognition, but both or more or less the same function. Uh, in the mid 70s, uh, we had the, uh, a trend of uh, getting more foreign graduates coming in Sri Lanka to practice medicine and uh, surgery. So we didn't have any instrument to accredit them and we neither had any licensing exam as well. So in uh, 1987, we had this uh, the amendment to the medical ordinance uh, that is um, um, uh, the special act, uh, act uh, giving us uh, uh, powers to accredit overseas medical uh, degrees. So uh, we had uh, formulated certain guidelines to accredit uh, specific medical degree programs overseas. And uh, we published it in uh, 2011, but though we have been uh, doing these accreditations from uh, 80s. So then we also uh, drafted guidelines for accrediting local universities as well in the 2000 level and published in the form of booklet. And we were carrying out the accreditation of foreign universities, especially these are the the programmatic accreditation of specific degree programs and uh, which was done by a, a uh, foreign degrees committee of the Sri Lanka Medical Council and uh, we uh, received uh, application from uh, uh, interested uh, universities, universities abroad and we did the DEX review and if necessary the site visits were undertaken to recognize the specific degree program. And uh, the problem surfaced when, as a uh, previous speaker uh, mentioned, the mushrooming of private medical schools in the region started in the uh, mid 70s and it grew to a tremendous level, bypassing. Uh, the state universities by the year 2000. So uh, we had the challenge of accrediting uh, one of the local private university. Uh, everybody knows that the site. So we put our existing mechanism into practice to accredit this particular university. That means the, uh, we had the guidelines drawn up by Sri Lanka Medical Council and ultimately it ended up, ended up in the, uh, the Supreme Court and we lost the case. The reason for us to lose the case is not having the regulation enacted in the form of act. So to take any regulation, the legally valid 
to become any regulation a legally valid instrument, it has to be enacted uh, by way of uh, act through the parliament. The Sri Lanka Medical Council, first, I mean, I myself had participated in a couple of uh, CRO accreditation workshop, and we have listened to uh, the methods of accreditation. We are aware of various instruments available to accredit, and Sri Lanka Medical Council is willing to have a separate accreditation unit established to meet the so-called uh, WFME deadline. The problem is we don't have legally valid regulation to act on. The minimum standard for medical education was actually uh, we discussed and we uh, drafted medical education, uh, the minimum standard in uh, as early as uh, year 2011. And we are now uh, after a, a decade has uh, passed, but you know, the minimum standards are yet to be gazetted in the parliament for us to act upon. And meantime, while this reality, I mean, this uh, dream become a reality, Sri Lanka Medical uh, Council, though slowly, has taken many steps to uh, have a separate accreditation unit. And Sri Lanka Medical Council recently uh, recruited a very respected senior medical educationist as um, the uh, head of the accreditation unit of Sri Lanka Medical Council. And we are in the process of a building a, a formidable team to accredit medical schools of Sri Lanka and abroad when this uh, minimum standard of medical education is uh, gazetted, now it has been gazetted and we are waiting uh, its enactment from the parliament. Once it is enacted, we can with confidence moving forward to see this accreditation becoming a reality in Sri Lanka. Because accreditation is very important to Sri Lanka in my point of view, not only for the foreign uh, uh, jobs or acceptances by the various countries. In Sri Lankan, healthcare setup is somewhat different to the those of developing countries or developed countries. Because in our system, our safe doctor, I'm referring to safe doctor means the doctor with the at least threshold standards. We are having a licensing exam, ERPM, people who are getting through the ERPM is the safe, I, I would say the safe doctors. They are safe to practice medicine in Sri Lanka because they are competent enough. So when we give them uh, the recruitment, I mean the positions, 90% of the doctors are recruited by the Minister of Health and they are given their position based on the merit list. The people who are sitting at the bottom of the merit list are the, I don't uh, use the word weakest, but the, the least uh, um, competent among the qualified. Those persons are posted in the most remote areas of the island where they have to practice with minimum infrastructure support, minimum supervision, and minimum, minimum uh, uh, assistance. So they must be competent enough to work alone. And they must be competent enough to diagnose and treat life-threatening conditions. And they must be competent enough to take up legal duties of doctors, sometimes performing postmortems and all the other legal, uh, what they call practices. So to this, to uh, do this lot of work alone, need a fairly 
refine sort of you know competencies so our threshold of a safe doctor must be little higher so to achieve this standard to meet the, this particular need of working alone in the peripheries to meet this need we must have outcomes which must be the full i mean uh, very high standard i mean to achieve this goal we must have a better accreditation system without such accreditation uh, accreditation system we may not be able to achieve the goals uh, expected and elaborated by the speakers before me so while uh, apologizing for not uh, being able to produce slides because i had a very busy schedule and i may take as many questions as possible at the end of this presentation and uh, that's all thank you Thank you, Dr. Hapogoda. Thank you for elaborating on the role of the Medical Council in regulating the medical profession and how we work towards maintaining standards in medical education, both in Sri Lanka and in the foreign medical schools from which we have graduates applying for registration with the Medical Council. Um, there are challenges that we face, not least among them being the legal status of what we can and can't do. Uh, but I'm sure we can work together towards overcoming those challenges. Again, I'm sure there are some questions, but let's hear from our last speaker and then take the questions. So, Asela, I will hand over to you to introduce the last of our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Hapagoda. And I think uh, the several initiatives taken by the Sri Lanka Medical Council were uh, highlighted very well, as well as the needs of the hour uh, with regards to minimum standards. Um, so uh, our next speaker is, uh, and, uh, is uh, Professor Kosala Marabe. Uh, she is uh, a professor in medical education at the Department of Medical Education in the University of Peradeniya and uh, again well known to uh, our audience and uh, an eminent medical educationist so over to you professor kosala okay thank you asela and let me also thank the sri lanka medical association for organizing this seminar on a very timely topic uh, sorry I can even minimize my video, right? <laughs> now that you have seen me. Okay, so having listened to the previous speakers and while thanking all of them for the very informative presentations, I was, I thought I will speak about the situation in the university system, the medical faculties at present. Uh, I should say, uh, 10 years ago, uh, this accreditation was not a familiar concept in the university system of Sri Lanka. I remember the dean at that time giving me a book uh, from the ECFMG, which said about this 2023 deadline. And that, uh, and he, his advice to me was, when we are doing curriculum revision, we will have to adhere to these things. We had to think in those lines because someday we will have to get this for the sake of some of the graduates uh, in our uh, faculties who would like to go abroad and practice overseas. That was the thinking at that time. Uh, however, I think today we are in a better position, especially after the program review process that took place in 2019 uh, in the university system. Uh, so the Quality Assurance Council of the university uh, the University Grants Commission, they trained, they created awareness among the staff members, they trained uh, reviewers, and they got this uh, process in place. So with that, I think it's not going to be a difficult task. Uh, I agree with Dr. Abe Kohn that, uh, you know, some kind of fine tuning will have to take place, but it wouldn't be such a, I think, daunting task for the medical faculties to adhere with these guidelines that 
have been uh, spelled out in the WFME documents for accreditation. But the issue is, as all of you all mentioned, the issue right now is with the national body. Do we have a national body uh, uh, to, uh, to get accreditation or uh, uh, accreditation uh, status from the WFME? That is where we are. And I also remember uh, as a member of the College of Medical Educationists and also prior to that as a member of the Forum of Medical Educationists, many seminars were organized to create awareness on this. And as a result, I think we have come to a state that a uh, lot of uh, key people are aware of it. So now we need, all of us need to get together and work towards having this national body in place. Uh, so uh, that's what I've got to say. I think then we can uh, we can stop at this and have the discussion. I suppose. Thank you, uh, Professor Kosala. And uh, as the um, president elect of the College of Medical Education, is I think you have a you also have a you know a big role to play uh, in the coming years uh, with regards to accreditation. Uh, endeavors in Sri Lanka, and uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, now, uh, uh, I think uh, we will. Uh, uh, there were a few questions from the audience as well uh, while the speeches were going on. Uh, so uh, maybe we will start with those uh, questions, and I'd like to direct the first question to Dr. Jujipa. Uh, a very important question. It was basically asking uh, that about the, uh, you know, the efforts and the cost uh, in accreditation, uh, as uh, all of the speakers have mentioned, with such a cost. Uh, the question was uh, in the, uh, whether there is an absence of impact evidence on the usefulness and the effectiveness of accreditation and uh, in, if there is an absence of impact evidence, whether this cost is worthwhile. Uh, so over to you, uh, Dr. Jujipa. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, very valid point. Um, I think that uh, currently, uh, as I think Dr. Sapata mentioned, uh, there's not much evidence that accreditation uh, there's a direct correlation with uh, improved practice or improved uh, uh, quality of care. Uh, there are circumstantial evidence and also uh, indirect evidence, but right now there's no direct evidence except for very few studies on very specific sites. Uh, now, so that's, that's one part. Then uh, about the cost. So for the cost, yes, uh, the WFME recognition process, it's a costly affair and especially for countries uh, with uh, less resources and, and does not have uh, you know, the, the resources like uh, countries like Australia, New Zealand or UK, Canada or even Singapore. So it is a costly thing. Why is it is costly is because as uh, uh, Dr. Palita Bikon mentioned, uh, the WFME has now created, based on the legal advice that we have got, a separate recognition committee. So the executive council is no longer involved in the recognition process and it is done by a separate uh, body of experts who will visit, who will also prior to the visit will uh, look at all the, the documentation, the visit, the, there will be a visit program, the interviews, etc. So, for all that, there's a cost involved, and that's why that it is quite costly. Um, well, is it worthwhile? Well, it's as I as I mentioned earlier, the WFME recognition process is completely voluntary. It's not forced on anybody, right? Uh, and it is a, a voluntary effort. And some countries. Uh, may decide, like Dr. Palita Bacon mentioned, that, okay, we don't want to send. And we are having these discussions, especially in the Western Pacific Association. And uh, our association actually span from Mongolia all the way 
to Australia, New Zealand, China, Australia, New Zealand, and Samoa, all the way up to Samoa, including Papua New Guinea. So we have countries who are quite wealthy, like uh, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, uh, and, and uh, Japan, uh, uh, South uh, Korea, uh, China. Uh, but also we have very poor countries like uh, Samoa, uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, so, uh, so these countries. So, the 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 issue is that as a as a body as an as a as a uh, country we need to decide what's the value add what are the returns on investment uh, in this process because it is again completely this will never be uh, uh, a mandated it's a voluntary process so the countries must decide whether it is going to go and uh, be part of this and in this endeavor some of the countries have decided that it is not really feasible for them to them to go. So, for example, like Papua New Guinea or Fiji uh, or Samoa, where they have only one or two medical schools. Uh, so, what they have done, as I mentioned earlier, their, their governments have given the authority to another uh, organizations like the Australian Medical Council to do that accreditation process of their medical schools. Or uh, they have asked and requested uh, countries uh, like uh, bodies like the Philippine Authority, which has now applied. Uh, the Samoa is going with Philippines, uh, the authority, or as I mentioned earlier, like Thailand, even though it is not within our Western Pacific region and it is part of Sierra Army, uh, Southeast Asian region, uh, they're asking that uh, body to do it. So there are different ways that different countries are, uh, are going through this to minimize the cost. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jidipa. And, uh, uh, Again, uh, very important and very interesting perspectives uh, uh, to see that there are multiple options available, but that, uh, you know, the timeline is short and we need to work fast on that. Uh, so uh, next, uh, there was another question on the different outcomes that are valued or, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, mentioned by the different accrediting organizations as well as the WFME and whether we can out align all these different outcomes required of the graduates with the uh, you know with the with the quality assurance process in Sri Lanka so uh, again uh, I'd like to uh, uh, ask this question direct that question to uh, Professor Nilanti De Silva uh, Director of the Quality Assurance Council, Madam. Uh, yes, Sasela. Um, interesting uh, perspective. Uh, and I think it depends on who will ultimately do the accrediting of medical schools in Sri Lanka for the purposes of getting WFME accreditation of that particular accrediting agency. So, for example, if we are able to get work out with the Sri Lanka Medical Council uh, and set in place a mechanism for accrediting medical schools so that the SLMC then gets uh, WFME recognition. Uh, the SLMC in its accreditation process can um, build into its uh, process uh, some means of uh, taking into account the QAC, the UGC's QAC uh, quality assurance process and the outcomes that have uh, ensued from the uh, quality assurance program reviews that took place um, within the last 12 months um, in the medical faculties in Sri Lanka. Uh, so I think that it should be quite feasible to work out something that doesn't create a, because for the, medic, the medical faculties in the state universities, there is no choice but to go through the UGC's QAC program review process. That is, the funding comes from the consolidated fund. It's a university, a medical faculty under the UGC. It is mandatory that it goes through that QA process. 
with the Sri Lanka Medical Council, we can work out a joint accreditation process. And this is something that is done in many, even in Australia, the professional accreditation uh, in the UK, professional accreditation works together with the, uh, the quality assurance process in the higher education system. So that's something that we can work out. But um, I'd like to go back to something that Dujipa pointed out, the many options that we have in terms of accreditation. And during this process, I wondered whether one uh, option that might be available to Sri Lanka would be to see whether we can uh, ask the independent accrediting agency that has been set up in Thailand, IMIAC, uh, whether we can join that consortium. I don't know whether that is something that might be possible or not, but it did strike me as a uh, something that we should perhaps explore. Oh, and also in terms of expenses, another observation that I would like to make is that uh, there are two layers of expenses involved. One would be for the accrediting agency, whether it's a Sri, if it's a Sri Lanka Medical Council, it will have to meet the expenses involved with getting the WFME recognition. I don't think the Medical Council has problems with being able to afford that. The resources are available. Uh, the other level is where the medical schools have to meet the cost of getting accredited by, say, for example, the Sri Lanka Medical Council. Um, so that is, again, something that we can look at and bring it to a point where it is not uh, unaffordable uh, for uh, the state medical schools. So, But I would like to hear Dujipa's uh, perspective yeah. on that idea about us joining the IMIAC consortium. Uh, th thank you, Madam. Uh, you are right. So as, as I mentioned earlier, some countries uh, are actually combining with, uh, they're going to a already um, what we call uh, a recognized body, independent body for their accreditation. And you saw that even some of the, the, the other places like the, the what you call um, the, the Netherlands or the Belgium, I can't remember, they are also accrediting. The Irish one is also accrediting their, their medical school in Bahrain, right? So that has been granted. However, the catch here is, I think Dr. Hapukode mentioned, I think there's a small issue and a barrier here. The WFME will only give that recognition if the, the government authority or even I think the, 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 the government must uh, the Ministry of Health or the, the government, the parliament itself must say or pass a, a resolution to say that this authority is given the, 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 the responsibility and they are accountable for ensuring the standards or accreditation process in, in that particular country. If that is not there, then this is not recognized. And we are, we are having this issue because Right now, I mentioned to you earlier about Philippines. Philippines have applied and Samoa, uh, some of the Samoan medical, there are two medical schools in Samoa. Uh, and one is a government one, uh, the National University of Samoa. And the second one is a private one uh, funded by American uh, businessmen. And uh, they are having uh, a medical school in Samoa, which is basically the American students who couldn't get into medical schools in uh, United States. They come to Samoa and then they do the basic science uh, learning and then they get attachments to US and they go there. So the issue is that the, the, because of uh, the nature of that medical school, because most of the medicine is learned through Zoom. I mean, we are now doing a lot of Zoom learning, but uh, uh, because of that, uh, the, the WFME is very, very uh, particular about getting this government seal of approval. So I think that's that's something you have to do. Sorry. Yes. The legal mandate needs to be established <laughs> clearly, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Get it. Do we have any other questions, Asela? I also, uh, while we are waiting, um, highlight a couple of other thoughts that came to my mind while listening to the speakers about the need uh, for having this process established in Sri Lanka. One is that we have postgraduate trainees going out to different countries 
prior to board certification. So if we don't have uh, recognition, accreditation of our medical schools, and in the UK, Australia, where other countries where they go for postgraduate training, they ask for accreditation of the medical school, we could run into difficulties in the future. So that's, I think, something that we really need to be uh, very aware of and uh, be on the ball about that. The second yeah. matter is that in terms of the Sri Lanka Medical Council and the fact that we have to uh, license practitioners, license graduates from foreign medical schools, and we go through this really tedious process of uh, recognizing those foreign medical schools prior to allowing those graduates to sit for a licensing exam. If we actually are able to say this medical yeah. so. Uh just to just to share, I think what uh, uh, Prof Nilanti mentioned as the first point, uh, it is uh, really important because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the the ECFMG mandate is also for trainees, postgraduate trainees, and even medical students going to do their electives to US. And uh, the the organization that uh, I am currently. Uh, uh, working with the, as the president of the Western Pacific Association for Medical Education. Uh, our secretariat is with the Australian Medical Council. So Australian Medical Council holds a secretariat. And um, I can I can uh, uh, share with you what uh, Dr. Palita Bacon uh, mentioned during his presentation that some of these medical councils from Australia, uh, from Canada, uh, from Ireland, they are actually actively looking at making this as part of their, the, the requirement for the foreign trainees to come to their country. So I think it is, I completely agree with uh, Professor Nilanti that we need to really think through uh, for the sake of our trainees, uh, what we are going to do and how we are going to go about doing it. I, I think Prof Nilanti has come back, yes. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, we are back online. It, it, this is something that we, you know, it, it will create problems for us. So we have to go towards that direction. The, it's expensive, I know, but I don't think we will have a choice in this matter going into the future. I think we are experiencing some little technical difficulties here at the moment. Do we have any other questions, Asela? Do we know? Many, uh, uh, you know, very important questions discussed. Uh, related to that, was, uh, uh, also was uh, now uh, with the, uh, I think this question was from Vasana, uh, was whether the new WFME standards edition again would apply uh, when we go with this uh, process of uh, accreditation. So uh, I suppose there are uh, two different issues again that uh, related issues. One is about the standards, the minimum standards, and whether our standards align with the WFME standards, and also then about the system and the outcomes of uh, accreditation or a quality assurance process done uh, by the university system in Sri Lanka. Uh, as Professor Nilanti said, how much that can be incorporated into an accreditation uh, you know, uh, to a WFME uh, related accreditation. So, uh, uh, any, uh, I'd like to invite the views of uh, any of the speakers um, on those. And also, I think Dr. Palita Bacon also uh, had some comments to make uh, about uh, the accreditation issues. Thank you. Thank you, I said actually Niranti referred to that. See, just to recall some of the things uh, you might might not been party at that time. You know, about uh, some time ago, Thomas might know, we were trying to establish, like Nilanti said about Thailand, we were in our zero region trying to establish a common mechanism and uh, about uh, six, seven years ago, I remember when Professor Carlo Fonseca was the president of the SLMC, uh, we organized a WHO organized meeting here and then in Nepal to develop a regional uh, council for uh, of medical education. 
the idea of that was anticipating some of these developments uh, that have now taken place to see whether we could have a system like not exactly getting another country to do this, but having a regional organization which could be uh, created. But that didn't happen uh, for a number of reasons. One is that uh, Thailand, you know, Thailand sits between two, two big sort of uh, organizations. They are in Cero, they are in APEC, and they work very closely with the Western Pacific region. So Thailand's position is pretty different. So they were not very keen to establish a CR1. Secondly, of course, our SARC region at that time, I don't know how it is now, was not very strong also, which means uh, like the APEC in, in the Western Pacific area, SARC was also poor, poorly organized set up with regard to medical education and health professional education. So that didn't work out. But the other problem about our region having its own thing is that we don't have any recipient countries. There aren't any countries in our region, including Thailand and Indonesia, where our graduates generally want uh, are used to going. So there was no great uh, enthusiasm for a number of country, from a number of countries to, to, to push this as a regional endeavor. Whereas the Western Pacific region, there are so many recipient countries, there are so many, uh, uh, what I call not donor countries, but uh, sending countries. So there the interest was slightly different and stronger. Now, second point I want to sort of make uh, about this Thai thing, of course, is that yes, it is possible to discuss with the Thais or I mean, whoever to see whether they, but the question here, uh, Nilanti knows is very well, is that whichever other organization outside Sri Lanka is trying to accredit our institution, we must have a strong institution. We must develop an institution which draws in, like Nilanti said, maybe the SLMC is the focal point, the center, but if you want to bring some elements of the political uh, assurance council, what they do also into it. So we have to get our act together before we invite anyone. But my point, I mean, with all due respect to, to Nilanti's idea, which I think is a very good one, if we can't get our act together fast, uh, I see no reason if everyone works together, why we can't make this happen. I don't know. I, because we have all the ingredients that could make it happen. Mm. Experience, expertise, you know, long history of... Uh, uh, recognition of medical schools. So it's a matter of organizing the governance uh, part of it and also resources. I don't think it's going to be a big issue in that sense. And mm. we can always negotiate with the World Federation and they are very amenable to this. I've discussed with them. You, We can have our local uh, priorities in medical education quite there. We don't have to. They are quite now, particularly now, uh, Dudip will say in the late current round, they are willing to make it quite flexible to suit the requirements of that particular country and to mm. the World Federation, that is crucial. Mm. The other thing, of course, the standards of education and the processes of education, the World Federation insists, should be more or less universal. But the mm. content can be, and the objectives can be, can be quite uh, tailored to our own. So mm. I see, firstly, we must endeavor to make it a local thing and a local SLMC or SLMC plus being the accrediting agency to go through this. And if for some reason we don't make that happen, then I say, I think Nilanti's idea is a very good one, at least to explore. Yeah. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Can I just uh, uh, come in here and then just uh, share a few things? I think uh, this, this will be really complimentary to what uh, Dr. Palita just now mentioned. Uh, so, sir, the, the very first thing uh, I want to mention, and then I'll go to what uh, Asel also alluded to. Um, so, the, the first of all, uh, let me uh, share with you how the IMEAC came about. Uh, so, in, in what happened was that I shared with you that earlier that in 2013, uh, the, all the ASEAN uh, the finance ministers, got together and they were putting together this uh, uh, agreement that within the ASEAN countries that they were developing a free trade, more or less free trade agreement. And one of the items was on uh, free movement of skilled labor. And uh, the 2015, come 2015, uh, this was ratified by all the, the heads of ASEAN countries. But uh, as I shared with you, there was a problem because we have so many medical schools and their standards differ so much. So based on this, the ASEAN Secretariat
created what we call the ASEAN Medical Deans uh, Network. And uh, what, they, what they wanted to do, taking into account all the challenges, they looked at the different ASEAN countries and they got the, the uh, this is controversial, but uh, the top ranked medical schools in different ASEAN countries, they are deemed to come together. And as the initial phase to develop common standards across ASEAN uh, and so that those graduates can move freely rather than allowing everybody to move across the ASEAN region. So that's how uh, we met several times in this ASEAN Dean Summit and then we decided that we all will pool resources and the expertise to develop this common body uh, called the IMIAC and uh, Dean Prasid from Siriraj University, uh, Siriraj Hospital uh, in, in Thailand actually led the way and we all supported and it got funding from uh, the China Medical Board also to set it up and uh, all the countries contributed and they set it up. So the, the whole point was that they were going, they are piloting the medical schools in uh, Thailand and they have got the government authority to do that. And then eventually we, we want to see whether they can expand it to countries which are poor in resources like Cambodia, uh, in the uh, in the ASEAN region, uh, Myanmar, etc., uh, for for that to come across. So, so that's how the IMIAC came about and the the focus of IMIAC in the region. Now, uh, for example, Singapore, we are developing our own system uh, because uh, we want to have our own accreditation status, uh, and we may not go to IMIAC, but we will we may be doing it. So is the Australia, New Zealand. Uh, and Philippines, uh, Japan has done it, China has done their own accreditation system. So these countries, we, we, we will be doing a separate accreditation uh, without going to the IMEAC as the ASEAN uh, uh, place. Now, when I come to the second thing, what you mentioned, I completely agree with you, sir, because uh, I have been working with uh, MEDAC on, uh, on some of the, the standard setting for midwives, and I have seen the the University Quality Assurance Agency's uh, accreditation standards. And I think definitely, and looking at the expertise in Sri Lanka, uh, we, we are in a very good position to develop our own thing. I don't think the resources, that, that will be an issue at all, right? So uh, I, I strongly feel that, you know, uh, the, the, the challenge is not getting these things, people together, and then also the standards, because we already, by looking at the, the university quality standards, you only need to tweak a few things. And the new standards that we have developed from WFME is very much outcome focused. And, and the university standards, if I look at it and compare with the new standards that the WFME putting out as a basic minimum standards, it's far higher, you know, what you have right now in Sri Lanka. So I, I don't think that it will be any problem. I think the biggest challenge would be to get it approved from the authorities. I, I think that's where the challenge would come in. Otherwise, I, I completely agree with you. I think that's the way we should go. Thank you. Yes, Dujipa, that uh, you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, it's that legal, uh, but um, let me also put it like this. The medical ordinance gives the medical council the authority to maintain standards of medical education in the country. Right? What we don't have in place are the regulations to make that happen and that is the minimum standards that were gazetted in 2018 but were not passed in parliament and that is a problem because the medical ordinance requires that for a regulation to become effective it needs to be passed by parliament so that's the issue but however all of the medical schools in the state medical faculties, in the state universities were agreed. It was a consensus document that the medical council developed. And we are all agreed that we are willing to accept that those standards and work by them. So, uh, you know, we will need to work at a political, uh, with the political interface to somehow get this done because it's in the best interest, the national interest of our country to make it happen. So... Uh, that's something that we really need to work on. Mm. And I also add here, 
Yeah. Yes, so, so I I would like to um, support uh, what uh, Professor Palita Bikun has mentioned. I think Sri Lanka has uh, more than enough capacity in order to set up a good accreditation system in the country. So I think uh, I would go in that direction, and maybe what it can be done is learning from the experiences from other countries. So I think uh, we could easily, from WHO, we could support uh, Sri Lanka in contacting, reaching out with Indonesia and Thailand, for example, and learning mm -hmm. the process they went through, because probably by understanding well the challenges they went through and how they set up the systems, you can take some lessons learned that can be applied for the Sri Lankan context. I think that's something that you could do, but I think it should be country-led and you have more than enough capacity and resources to set up a, a strong accreditation system within the country. And I also agree with Palita, what he was saying, uh, um, that it will not require dr drastic and big changes in the, in, the, in the way you set up the systems. I think it will be a question of fine tuning and, and adapting to the, to the global guidance and also trying to improve some th circumstances. And the critical issue probably will be bringing all the stakeholders together and see how you can manage the different power issues between the different stakeholders, which probably will be the critical bottleneck. Over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zapata. I think we are coming to the last 10 minutes of the uh, workshop and the webinar. So uh, uh, I, again, I think uh, it has been very clearly mentioned uh, that we Sri Lanka has the resources but uh, and uh, that uh, the experts expertise is there and uh, the you know the motivation to go forward is there as well so uh, uh, with regards to the wfme standards uh, from what dr jujipa says again the next version of the standards again uh, will be quite overarching in that sense, I think uh, our standards could be accommodated and compared and aligned well with those stand uh, with the WFME standards. So the issue, as all the speakers mentioned, is how to uh, you know get these standards gazetted, enacted by the parliament, so that we can move ahead with the process of. Uh, accreditation, which again, uh, a well-established quality assurance process is there in the Sri Lankan university system and uh, which can be incorporated with that systems uh, with the guidance of the SLMC as well. So uh, any, uh, I would like to ask uh, any other comments, any last comments? Uh, or Seller, Thank you. there is a question in the chat. Uh, from Kumar Mendis, who says, as you know, all state medical schools are not up to the same standards. For example, there's a wide gap between Colombo and the most recent new medical school. If SLMC is accredited as the accrediting body, there will be significant pressure to question the standard of one medical school. It will be easy to question a private medical school, but what will happen if a state medical state school standard is questioned? The second question is if there is a new private medical school coming up in Sri Lanka, can this institution get accreditation from another WFME accredited institution? So uh, I can answer the second one first. Uh, as I shared earlier, uh, the WFME will not recognize, uh, will not extend its recognition uh, to any body which will go beyond their mandate unless the government or the authority in that particular country gives the exclusively the authority for that particular agency to go and accredit whatever the medical school in another country. So it has to be given in, in, in uh, written, uh, written and handed over to the, to the authority. So unless that, uh, the WFME will not recognize. Uh, can I take on the first part of it uh, about 
what if the SLMC is the accredited uh, accrediting agency, the recognized accrediting agency, and there is a state medical school that is not meeting standards. Um, the funding for state medical schools comes through the UGC and the Ministry of Higher Education. And in that sense, the Sri Lanka Medical Council is really independent uh, because it comes under the Ministry of Health. And we look at things from the perspective of the health requirements, of the health needs of the country. And so uh, the SLMC does, in that sense, have the required independence to do that. Uh, and it also, to a I think to a large extent has the legal mandate also to do it, uh, the legal mandate and the, uh, the medical ordinance. Um, we also need to look at something that Dr. Zapata mentioned right at the beginning in his presentation, that accreditation needs to approach things from ensuring standards, but also looking at means of enhancing quality of education and supporting medical schools in improving what they do. And I think every medical school, whether it's Colombo or Peradenia or, or Bayamba and Sabaragamu, which are the latest additions to our state, we can all do with improving what we offer uh, in terms of education to our medical students. And that, I think, has to be a very, very uh, something that we keep at the center of our minds when we engage in accreditation of medical schools. And um, as you, everybody has agreed, we do have that capacity to make it happen in Sri Lanka. Can I Any? say something, Asela? Asela, can I say something? Oh. Can I say something? Yes, Dr. Kosala, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think I also fully endorse what Professor Nilanti said. Uh, if, if a particular medical faculty is not having whatever is not up to standard, they can certainly improve by asking for more funds, more resources, and also in this new normal, I think most of their issues are getting kind of sorted out. They, they do not have that much of an issue with patients and, you know, uh, clinical training. Their issues are really with the paraclinical, preclinical training, the teachers and those things. So I, of course, feel there wouldn't be that much of a problem and particularly with the new normal way of handling things. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Kosala. And uh, again, I think uh, it comes down to uh, the timelines that we set and the collaborations that we have at different levels, at an institutional level, as well as at a cross-institutional level. So the SLMC is an independent body so that uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, accreditation standards and that uh, the process will be upheld uh, for any uh, for accountability issues. Uh, while the, in the university system, knowing that this accreditation process is going to happen, uh, we have a few years where we can develop because the standards are out there. And once the minimum standards are again gazetted, uh, we know the standards that we need to achieve. And we have the capability if we help each other, even for the new medical schools with the state backing to achieve those standards. So I don't, as I also agree with the speakers that uh, that will be probably the least of the issues if we uh, direct the support and uh, get together as a community. Uh, so uh, any final thoughts that uh, any, would anyone like to contribute or uh, anything from the audience? You can certainly uh, put up your hand and ask in the final couple of minutes. So uh, in the absence of uh, uh, questions, uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers for the uh, valuable contributions. And it was a very, uh, uh, you know, a very uh, invigorating, interesting, and, uh, you know, formative discussion on uh, accreditation. And uh, we all recognize that minimum standards need to be uh, established very well and with that 
national accreditation body with the support of the Sri Lanka Medical Council uh, can take this forward uh, with the and uh, I'd like to just end by uh, mentioning the three things that we have uh, uh, we have with us, as mentioned by Dr. Palita, a very established university quality assurance system, uh, expertise in medical education, and the Sri Lanka Medical Council and its, uh, you know, a willingness to take this forward. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, we will uh, conclude the webinar. Thank you for all for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.